Welcome to today's webinar, Getting the Information and Resources You Need for Child Care Recovery and Stabilization, featuring Deputy Director Patricia Tilley with the Division of Public Health Services. Today, you'll be hearing updates from the following. Can you change the slide, Emma? Department of Health and Human Services update with Marty Ilg, the Deputy Director of the Division of Economic and Housing Stability. Public Health Update from Patricia Tilley, Deputy Director of Division of Public Health Services. The Child Care Licensing Update with Melissa Clement, Chief of Child Care Licensing. From the Bureau of Child Development Head Start Collaboration, we have Deborah Nelson, the Bureau Chief. And then an update from Child Care Aware of New Hampshire regarding programming and services from myself, Tracy Pond. Questions and answer period will be conducted at the end and to promote full active participation in today's webinar. As we said before, the chat feature will not be available during the call for view. Emma will be assisting us with that, with the questions at the end of the webinar and then after um, Trish Tilly as well. So first, we will be hearing from Deputy Director Marty Ilg from the Division of Economic Housing and Stability, followed by our featured speaker, Patricia Tilly. Marty? Good afternoon. I was just outside going to the mailbox and I, it's so humid out and I just looked in the video and I, it needs some like cream rinse or something. But uh, good afternoon, everybody. Last webinar, I shared a photo of my grandson's first swim. Want to go back in the slide? Here he is sitting in the grass for the first time not sure that he likes it very much. It's a new experience. But he sticks it out and soon enough he's using a real pure pincer grip and picking and attempting to eating to eat some clover flowers. Last time we met, I talked a little bit about my experience in my new role during the stay at home order and how impressed and encouraged I was to see all of you push through fear, anxiety, and worry to attempt to adapt your practices and innovate to offer services under difficult circumstances. At that time, the Bureau of Child Development and Head Start Collaboration has stood up another program, and Deborah will have updates on a CCRSP later in this webinar. But I want you to know that I'm more, than, more amazed than ever at your collective ability to try new things, even when they're a little scary, like sitting in the grass. I talked with a few of you over the past week, and I appreciate the time you took to share with me your frustrations and worries regarding the CRISP award. I hope I was able to help you feel secure in your ability to navigate this process. And remember that you always can reach out to Child Care Aware of New Hampshire and the Bureau of Child Development and Head Start on yourself. The work that you do is incredibly important. You can safe and help them to develop optimally, you support parents' ability to work and attend school. You allow employers to hire dependable, productive employees and support communities through partnerships and referrals. As we move from crisis to recovery and stabilization, now that we are used to trying new things, even when it's scary, let's keep working together to create and innovate and build childcare back stronger than ever. I want us to walk deliberately together, acknowledging that we're not going back to the way things were pre COVID. The Bureau and the Division of Economic and Housing Stability is happy to work with centers on an individual basis. The CCRSP program is not a bailout, it's not meant to make you whole. If you were running in the red pre COVID, it will not make up for this. However, if you feel that the delivery of funds is very concerning to you and there is an immediate threat to a previously healthy program, folks from the Bureau of Head Start Collaboration and the DHHS Finance Office will meet with you as individuals. Further, in the world of work and school and general life, we know that things will not be back to normal. There will be a new normal. And we're interested in meeting with regions to discuss strategies related to this new world. We know that there are national and state trends for regional coordination of care, gen programs, family home care, neighborhood co-ops for childcare, and other things on the horizon. 
And we want to work on this with you together. This is an example of the approach that was presented to the governor's office for emergency response and recovery. This is the, pro the approach that we know will produce the best outcome for New Hampshire children and families. And I'm going to turn it over to Patricia from. I'm going to turn it over to Patricia Tiller. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marty. Um, Emma, if you can flip the next slide, that's great. Um, thanks, Marty, for those words. Um, you know, I am, I also thank you for having me join you today. It's, it's great to be with all of you. And I applaud all that you've been navigating over the past few months. I'm joining you today from our Public Health COVID Operations Center, which is my new normal. I am not typically used to working out of a hotel room um, with a giant call center of hundreds of contact tracers, but here we are today. So my job um, over the next few minutes is to give you a brief overview of some of the COVID data that is as fresh as today, and then answer a few frequently asked questions and maybe answer some more that might come in through the chat box. Um, Emma, if you can switch the slide, please. So here are our latest numbers. We are still just shy of 6,000 cumulative cases in New Hampshire and less than 800 current cases of COVID-19. Just less than 60% of our current cases are in Hillsborough County. The good news is only 22 people are in, currently in the hospital and no one is in the ICU right now with COVID-related illness. 360 children and youth in New Hampshire have tested positive for COVID-19. And we continue to see those numbers slowly increase. For the past week, we are averaging just about 20 new cases a day. And our current hospitalizations continue to go on a downward trend to levels that we have not seen since March. Our contact tracing program is robust and continues to monitor more than 3,400 individuals with check-in calls and texts. And then you can switch the slide. Um, even if you get a negative test. So one of the questions that we have been asked a lot is who needs to quarantine? So what, back to the guidance that we have provided, we know that children or staff with any COVID symptoms, any of the list of symptoms, children or staff who report close contact with someone suspected or confirmed with COVID-19, and then children or staff that reported travel risk. Even if you get a negative test, it is not permissible to return before the 14-day quarantine because it can take up to those two weeks for either symptoms to appear or for the virus to be detected. So that's really important for us to think about. I know that we've had a number of questions, especially over the 4th of July weekend, of who, of who can and who cannot come back into the center. So again, it's really around anyone with a symptom, anyone who reports close contact with someone suspected or confirmed with COVID-19, and then any children or staff that have traveled and those travel um, risks really contain whether or not you have traveled outside of the New England area by a public conveyance. So that's a plane, a train, a bus. If you've traveled in one of those public conveyances, we know that that's um, a, a risk for you. You can flip to the next, screen, the next slide for me, please. So in that 14 days, you know, how do you calculate that time? So close contact with someone who has had COVID-19 and you're not going to have further contact, it's pretty easy. It's from the last day that you had contact and then 14 days forward. What's a little more complicated is if you're under quarantine and had additional close contact with someone who has COVID-19, you need to start that 14 days right over again. So that's what that calendar represents. So for example, I had some contact with someone 
close contact with someone, I start my quarantine, but then I need to have close contact with them again, that 14 days starts all over again. So you can flip to the next switch, uh, the, the next slide for me. And again, as I noted, the travel-related quarantine questions are really about whether you traveled the past 14 days internationally. I'm not sure anybody who's doing that this day, right now, but it's possible. Um, by cruise ship, again, I don't know of many cruise ships that are going out there, although many of us might sit in our house and, and wish we were on a cruise ship. The good news is they aren't out there and we aren't traveling right now by cruise ship. Or whether more likely you travel domestically within the U.S., outside of the New England area on public transportation. Again, travel in private vehicles is totally permissible at this time. So we'll go to the next slide. Here are the other questions that I keep getting right now and, and working with child care centers around the state. This really falls into two of these other buckets. One is about the small cohort. The guidance that's available right now says that child care programs should, whenever possible, reduce group sizes to no more than 10 people total, including children and adults. These small cohorts reduce the exposure and the impact if somebody becomes ill or there's some sort of exposure. Fewer people exposed equals fewer people who potentially need to quarantine. So this is protective both to everyone's health at the center, and it is also protective to your bottom line because you have a smaller group of children and adults and staff that might need to leave at a moment's notice if there is some sort of potential contact. But I wanna make sure that you note that there is some flexibility within this language. While we really recommend cohorts of 10 or fewer, please note that that guidance says whenever possible, because we know that there are gonna be moments when that isn't possible, when you're going to need to mix those groups, but know that that carries a risk whenever you do that. The second question that I get a lot right now is around outdoor play. And one of our number one um, rec uh, recommendations at this point is spend time outdoors as much as you can. I know today is like a million degrees and the humidity is crazy and um, Marty's hair may be going like this. My hair just goes like this in the, in the humidity. So I appreciate all of that, but we wanna make sure that we're spending as much time outside as possible because we know that that reduces risk. Water play, totally acceptable. I think everybody needs to get those sprinklers out right now, those spray bottles, the little water gun fun games, anything, those are all fine. Just limit the sharing of toys and stay within your small cohorts. We've had questions around cleaning, um, and so be sure to clean those high touch surfaces made of plastic or metal, grab bars, railings, those things can be cleaned routinely. The playground and playground equipment just needs routine, normal cleaning. The most important thing here is to just follow the directions on your cleaning and disinfectant products. There's no need to do anything crazy to the sidewalks or to the grass or to any of those things, but really it's those high touch services which you're already cleaning right now in your community. You're already, when you can find the supplies, and I know that that's been a challenge, um, cleaning all of those high touch items, the tables, your door, your doorknobs, your light switches, just be walking around and making sure that you have, um, you're wiping those down, and most importantly, that you're following the directions on cleaning and disinfectant products. So those are the big things that I wanted to talk about today. We're in a good place. Um, our numbers continue to move down. We have had opportunities in some child care um, centers across the state where we've had um, staff or children who have tested positive and we work closely with those child care centers about how to get testing and to provide them with the guidance that they need. We know that the areas of the state that are most at risk right now are in Hillsborough County although there is COVID um, infection throughout the state, but just in smaller numbers. 
and that we're watching very carefully those numbers. We're watching the small increases among children, and we're watching the increases in working age adults who are your staff those 20 to 29 year olds, and also even those 50 to 59 year olds, which is the largest age cohort that we have right now with a COVID infection. So I'll wrap that up right now. I wanted to be just very quick, um, but I am happy to answer any questions that might be out in that chat, chat box right now. Hi, Patricia. Um, one question that I have is um, about get togethers, birthday parties, graduations, um, parents in programs are asking if people have been attending these, should they quarantine for 14 days? Um, what is, what's the guidance on that? Sure, that's a great question. And we certainly want to um, continue to recommend people to social distance as much as possible. And it's really hard. We've been in this for months now. Um, and it's really hard to keep putting off um, those birthday parties and those graduations. At this point, we don't have a specific recommendation that if you've attended this event, that you should quarantine for 14 days. But we really want to continue the education to your families to continue to wear those face coverings when they are in groups where they cannot maintain social distance. Um, we will let people know. So whenever there's a positive test for COVID-19, that, that positive test gets automatically sent to the Division of Public Health Services and then we notify that person. And in doing that, we find out who their close contacts are. And that's where we've had the opportunity to work with a couple of childcare centers already to help give them the advice that they need around what it means to be in close contact. And you know, the, the short answer to that is close contact is where you're within six feet of each other for more than 15 minutes at a time. So um, again, that's a great question, but we don't have guidance right now that if if you went to a birthday party, you know, you got you gotta go, you can't come back to childcare. But I, I do wanna hope that you continue to educate your families that um, any of those get togethers where you can't maintain social distance presents risk for um, your kids, your families, and your staff. Thank you. More questions? Um, yeah, there's one more that I'm gonna use um, because you just spoke to this a little bit. Um, but someone gave a specific example. So you just spoke about close contact in regards to exposure. Um, so the example that's being provided is if a teacher or a child in one classroom were confirmed positive with COVID and one child in that classroom has a sibling in another classroom, uh, would that secondary classroom be considered exposed as well? So um, we would work closely with you. So when, again, when that staff member or someone, you know, has a positive test, um, you can expect our Bureau of Infectious Disease to be giving your child care director a call to work through some of these questions. Um, typically, no. The answer to the specific question is, does that sibling also be, you know, would they also be exposed or considered to have to go out for quarantine? Typically not, but we would really have to know more details um, to give a definitive answer. And again, um, we really encourage when you have those very specific questions or cases that you give us a ring at the Bureau of Infectious Disease. I know many of you have worked with us for years and years, whether it's for flu or other sort of outbreaks, um, but we're, that's, we're here to help you and here to walk through some of those scenarios. And then the last question I'll ask you, Patricia, if you have time, is um, if you anticipate changes to childcare regulations for the fall, um, if they are planning for the fall, do they need to know specific information? For example, um, will groups remain at 10? Will this be changed? Um, and how soon they'll be able to find this out? Sure. So we are currently working on the reopening task force um, around the guidelines. Um, we have not moved. We are looking to move forward with some additional guidelines when the governor's office and when public health feels comfortable to be able to phase into a next approach. It's my understanding right now, and certainly the feeling right now, is that the small cohorts is really a solid recommendation. Uh, we are in a good place right now in the state. As I said, we're averaging 20 to 22 cases a week. That's great. Um, but we certainly know that all around the country right now, there are dramatic increases. And we know um, that it's unlikely that we're going to be isolated from that forever. 
Um, you know, I think New Hampshire is doing the right thing because New Hampshire residents are wearing those face coverings. Um, there are folks like you in your, in your child care communities are doing the right thing and doing all of the health screening and social distancing and the cleaning and the disinfecting to keep everybody safe. Um, but I think we're all worried that um, in the future we may anticipate increased cases. So I don't know that there's going to be a change to those small, small cohort recommendations anytime in the near future. You know, many of you are aware that we are um, currently working on the K-12 to guidance for schools. I think that that's going to have some implication for certainly those of you that do after-school programs for school-age kids. Um, the recommendations have been made to the governor's office from the task force that was put together by the Department of Ed. Right now, public health is reviewing those in partnership with the governor's office um, to better understand what those recommendations from the task force were. Um, but I think that you, what you will see as a consistency is that it is better to spend time in those small cohorts. And especially for our younger kids in, in childcare that don't have really have the capacity to social distance. You know, our toddlers cannot social distance. So it makes sense to keep those groups relatively small. Any other questions? Um, I think because so many are coming in right now, what I will do is switch them over and then I will get them to you after and we'll post them on Child Care Aware, anyone who didn't have a question answered at this time. That's great. And again, my office is always happy to answer questions directly. We, we work with a number of child care providers. Um, I just wanted to give you a very brief update on the numbers address some of those quarantine questions that I know that have been coming up over and over, especially related to travel um, and about those small cohorts. And, you know, and finally, I'll just wrap up by recognizing that we know that this is hard. Um, we know that it's financially difficult as well, but it's also the right thing at this moment in order to keep your family safe, keep your children safe, and to keep your staff safe. So thank you, and please know that we appreciate all of the work that you've been doing. Thank you, Tricia. That was great. You're welcome. Very informative. So our next speaker is Unit Chief Melissa Clement from Child Care Licensing. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to quote unquote see you. Um, the one update I want to give right now, it's the one we're getting the most questions about, is when are we going to be resuming our normally scheduled visits or unscheduled visits as they are? Um, I, one thing I want to make sure the message is clear is that we didn't completely halt doing visits. What we have done is we prioritized them to make sure that we were doing any serious complaints that came in, to make sure that we are able to license new programs, to, because that has happened. We've had some change in ownerships. We've had some new programs that wanted to open up. Or um, as people have opened up new space, um, we've gone out and done visits there as well. Um, so it wasn't a complete halt to visits, but we are looking now to go further, not further, but to continue again with our regular monitoring because that is critically important to make sure that children and staff are safe at programs, to make sure that parents have that assurance from us and we are obligated to do so under both statute and federal regulations. So we are looking to do that. We are working with Trisha Tilly and others in public health on um, those protocols to make sure that we are doing so safely. We have participated in what we call donning and doffing. We're learning a whole new vocabulary here, as I'm sure most of you are as well, on how to safely put on masks and how to make sure we are washing our hands, not just the way we've always been taught to wash our hands, but we're doing it in a way um, so that it's effective um, or using hand sanitizer. So we have had that training. We are, all of our staff have been supplied with masks um, and they will, and also hand sanitizer um, so that they have that available to them. We will be washing our hands before entering a classroom and all, you know, th those types of health and safety things that we're really looking to make sure that we're doing at this time. Once we have the firm guidance on that, we will continue to start going out and doing our monitoring visits. So I just wanted to make sure that people were aware of that. Um, and that should be happening shortly. We are also reviewing our rules and we have been, we've been doing this continuously because we know that we have had concerns expressed to us about certain things that people are not able to be in compliance with just because of other circumstances. 
One of those being um, physicals. That's the question we're getting the most often that staff and children are unable to do their well checkups or that that's not what you know doctor's offices are doing at this time. And I think that has been varying between doctor offices, um, what's been available. So we are reviewing those and other types of rules and we'll be issuing some guidelines shortly about what you can expect for that. We certainly know that we, we're not gonna hold you accountable for something you're not able to do. <laughs> I wanna make that clear. We're just looking to see you know, how we have to look at that moving forward and how we're going to communicate to you those types of things that we're gonna look at. I just saw something pop up about criminal reports. I'm assuming in, you mean the background checks. So that is determined by state police. The state police criminal records unit, they are the ones who have halted the ability to complete a fingerprint background check. So until they, are, um, they lift that restriction on, that they have, that is when um, we will do fingerprints again. We will certainly communicate that to everybody as soon as they've changed it. I checked their website just before coming on this webinar and there's been no updates or changes to their directive to not complete fingerprints at this time please go to our website because there are still background checks that need to be completed and there's a different process for that right now. You just can't do the fingerprinting part, but there are other parts that can be done, including the in-state one without the fingerprints. So make sure you go to our website and see that new process so that you, you are completing what you need to at this time. Um, so those right now, that is the update I have here. Um, we are definitely looking to make sure that when we are out doing visits that we're doing so safely. We're working with public health on that. We also, besides childcare licensing, I work within a broader licensing unit for health facilities. So I also have the resources of the staff that go out and inspect hospitals and other health facilities, and they have been doing so at this time. So I'm relying heavily on my partners there to also assist us with how to safely go into programs and keep my staff and your staff and the children and the family safe. Um, so that's my update at this time. And I, I'm certainly happy to answer questions or we can move along. <laughs> Is there any questions, Emma? Um, the only question that came in that you did not answer um, was how do we work with letting new staff in a room by themselves at this time? I'm sorry, I'm not quite, I heard, Quite sure how letting what staff I think that they mean being able to be left alone with children maybe if they're new um, that's the only information that they gave how do we work with letting new staff in a room by themselves um, if, if you're, whoever wrote that wants to write more clarification then we can post it after uh, oh without a criminal report okay so Right now, you're unable to do a fingerprint background check, but you can do other background checks. So once those are completed, that is, you know, that's what we're looking for. So the same rules are in effect. It just doesn't apply to the fingerprints. So complete your other background checks at this time. And then quickly, are online first aid and CPR classes um, acceptable? For now, we are doing waivers for those um, because the, the rule is very specific about needing an in-person test. So until we're able to um, do those in-person tests, programs that would need to request a waiver if that is, if people need to be certified in that way at this time. We don't, the way statutes are, or rules are written, we can't do a blanket waiver. We can't just say as a department, that we are allowing everybody to do an online CPR first aid if our rule doesn't allow us to do that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a rule about rules. We can't just do a blanket waiver, but we are certainly willing to have um, people give us a waiver request for that, and we will certainly process those. And I, um, for now, I also want to make sure um, I'm communicating again if there are other issues that you're coming across that you say we can't be in compliance, please reach out to your licensing coordinator or to our office so we can work with you on that. I'm not going to sit here and try to think that I have thought of every possible thing that could poss that you're coming up against. I, I can't even imagine that that's possible right now. So any concern that you are having about not being able to maintain compliance, please reach out to your licensing coordinator or office and we will work with you on that, on getting that addressed.
Thank you, Melissa. Tracy, we can move on. The rest of the questions I will include at the end. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. I want to make sure we we acknowledge, you know, the time and um, you know resources with Melissa and webinar. It's really invaluable to have them here in person, and we just we appreciate it so much. So. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for that update. So next on the agenda is uh, Deborah Nelson, Bureau Chief from the Division of Economic and Housing Stability, Bureau of Child Development Head Start Collaboration. Welcome, Deborah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today as we talk about having, I'll say, our Tracy, our Trish, and our um, Melissa with us. I'm, I'm reminded of when I first became part of what everybody calls the Head Start family uh, and Head Start community. And, and the language was always, you know, our friends in this class or our friends over here. I just, I love that language. So I think about all our colleagues and partners as our friends working together with us, you know, on, on everything we do because we all have the same goals that we're seeking. So in my time together with you all today, um, I really have two purposes that I'm, I'm hoping to accomplish. One is to share some exciting, what we find exciting information about the status of our CCRSP awards. And secondly, to address some of your questions and concerns that you have been raising with us about the CCRSP process and awards. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So let's begin with some statistics that I find exciting. So we have, four, we had 420 applicants representing 598 programs apply. And we originally thought it was 605, but when we dug into, you know, th those, those other ones really were like when somebody had started an application, had a false start and then started again, or there were a couple of duplicates. So when we filtered through, it ended up being 420 applicants representing 598 programs and that were notified about their CCRSP awards. So of those, 95% at this point, 570 applicants have received their award letters. And the remainder have not as yet because they need to um, submit some additional documentation or answer some questions that they skipped on the application that we need to have responses to before we can go forward with an award. So um, one thing that we're doing to hopefully make life easier for all of you busy people, and I know sometimes watching a video is so much faster than reading instructions. I know that's true of me. I, when I don't know how to do something, I hop on YouTube, you know, rather than like dig out a manual and read 14 pages. So Diane is working on a video uh, of the agreement and attestation process, which will be available on Child Care Aware of New Hampshire on the website. And also the link will be emailed to all of the CCRSP awards. So that should be an easy peasy way for you to, to hear and see um, what you need to do in, in, in order to follow the steps, the steps to get your, your funding. And here's the TADA. So far, 14 million nine hundred eleven and four hundred nine hundred eleven thousand four hundred dollars have been awarded in round one funds to 570 programs. So we had talked about approximately 15 million going out in round one. And pending is another little over half a million dollars that we're wait, you know, we, that will be, we're waiting for um, 28 programs with missing documents that need, you know, need to provide further information so that we can give them their awards. And then the range of awards were, were from teeny weeny 1600 from the individual family providers with a couple of kids to more than 1 million for, for you know, multi-site programs serving more than 500 children. Um, so the, um, I wanted to mention that the, the, the amount of awards that are in your, this, and the total amount is subject to change as we make adjustments for the number of children that um, are, you are approved to serve. And approved to serve means either through child care licensing, it's the number of spaces you're, you're licensed to have children in those spaces, um, well spaces, uh, but also uh, license exempt or from camp licensing or another body that approves your 
uh, the number of children that you can, can have. So um, we will be providing you with updated funding information as we, as we have it. Can you provide the next slide, please? So, so the next thing I wanted to address, we've heard, we've heard from many of you or a number of you, um, so are the questions and concerns and comments from the field, which are always very um, informative to us and, and, and help us to understand that sometimes um, information that we think is broadly known may not be. So this is an opportunity to share information so that we all have the same understanding. So the first question that came to our attention is, why haven't you shared the total amount of funds that everybody requested? And we understand the importance of that, and we know that our, our friends and advocates and others want to get a handle on, gee, just what is the, the loss and the needs of our childcare community, and isn't this a good opportunity to get a handle on that? And the answer to that question is, as soon as we have a number in which we have confidence, meaning we can trust the validity of it, meaning that we have checked and made sure that amounts requested were allowable by COVID and met other requirements, for example, um, COVID, uh, the CARES Act dollars, COVID funding prohibits what they call double dipping. So if you got, you know, PPP, uh, payroll protection program money for your staff, you can't get that from us for the same time period for the same staff. Or if you were paid, you know, to take care of uh, children with child care scholarship, we can't, you can't, uh, we can't give you funds for those same children for that same time period. So we had to sort of filter through and, and in the interest of um, getting money out the door as quickly as possible for this round one of awards, we didn't do a deep dive into, um, into all the financials and into everything. We did look at the financials briefly to help us understand some of the questions we had a little better, uh, but we will get more deeply into that for round two. And once we have a number in which we have confidence, we will happily share that number with everybody. So um, why wasn't this, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to, I just thought of another question that's part of that, um, part of all of this. Why is, there, why is there round one, round two, which actually links to the question, why wasn't the CCRSP designed like Main Street? Why, why didn't you all design it just like Main Street, where we got all of our funds up front, we're in dire need, we need access to those funds. Why are you making us um, invoice and do it over you know, a period of time? Um, and and why, you know, why is it, was it set up that way? Well, the answer was that there are major different purpose, or the, the purposes for the two programs are very, very different. Main Street was set up for what, what you all you know, were, were thinking about, get us the money all in one chunk, one time fast, out the door and done. Whereas the reason that we have the CCRSP funding is that the Emergency Child Care Cooperative went to Gopher, and that was DHHS, DOE, and, our, um, and some other um, private partners, and asked for funds, actually uh, uh, submitted a proposal to Gopher saying, can we please have funds to support the child care community? And Gopher, and, and with, within that request was the fact that it would be, the funding would be set up for the purposes of recovery, um, you know, recouping, recovery, sustainability, and long-term building it back even stronger, even better, and thriving. So it was never intended to be one and done, here's your money, and, and that's it. This was set up to help the childcare community survive the COVID challenges and then come out the other end striving. So we set it up in several rounds. So round one is, you know, you got your, most of you got your first awards and then the balance, if you want the whole balance within 30 days, you know, you can, you can invoice um, for that within 30 days. And then we'll be setting up a round two of funding for which you need to apply again. It's one application that covers round one and round two. And so um, really the invoicing, aside from some of the protocols for spacing them, like ongoing for round two, it'll be every other week that you can invoice us. 
um, will be designed for you to draw down the funding from your award as you need it. Because we've heard from some of you that you're worried about the tax liability and gee, what if I draw down that money and I don't need it and then I'm liable. So we tried to build it um, to be drawn down as you need it. But as Marty said, we've heard from a couple of you that, that you're very, very concerned about, you know, we need it now and I don't know if we can wait, you know, 30 days between the first and the second invoices. So if that's the case and, and, and we say that you're really in dire need and without getting your full round one award up front, it's really gonna put you at serious risk for closing your doors then we will talk to you individually. It's not just, you know, if, you, if it would be nice to do that and, you know, you'd like to have the money earlier, it's really going to be based on dire need. And the reason for that is um, we want to be responsive to individual needs because we did not want to build a one-size-fits-all, but we also have to be able to manage um, getting the funding out for you and doing the monitoring that we're charged with, with doing. So the next question is, um, why was there a delay in getting the ward letters out? Because Main Street got theirs out really quickly. Well, the main reason for that is, again, we're not Main Street. Um, and Main Street did, they did a pre-qualifying round where they got everybody's financials and documentation. Then they did a round, then they did a second, I mean, round, excuse me, an application. And then the second application, they did a deep dive and then they were able to get the money out one and done. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could um, take the time necessary to provide a little support through the application process to our friends in the childcare community. And by that I mean, if you uh, submitted, a, uh, submitted a Main Street award, um, you may get screened out and disqualified if you did not submit a completed application or if you submitted for things for which um, the, the funds were not intended. Instead of doing that, we decided that we would reach out and help you complete your application. So if you didn't submit your 2017 financials and instead sent us 2016, which we didn't need, or you only sent us one and not the others, rather than disqualifying your application, you got a personal call or email saying, we noticed we don't have this, would you please submit it? Or if you skipped question five and we really needed that answer to help us look at your application, we would call or email saying, please just give us the, the um, answer to question five. And I, I have to say, as a person who's lived almost her entire adult life on grants, mostly federal grants, um, this is a vastly different procedure than, you know, say, U.S. Department of Education. When I worked at the Institute on Disability, and we were warned, you know, if you don't follow the protocol exactly, um, and submit your full application, you're thrown out, we won't even look at it. And that was, that felt really harsh. As an example, one of my colleagues spent three weeks killing herself writing an application and her application was thrown out. You know why? Because she didn't do one inch margins all the way around and she single spaced a table instead of double spacing it. So that application got thrown out. That's not us. Um, we wanted to take the time to make sure that everybody you know, had, you know, had an opportunity to give us a complete, um, complete full application so that we could make sure that all of you who were otherwise qualified could get your award. So that took time. We're a small team and we were doing the best we can, but that took time. So the next question is, why did you ask for financials if you're gonna use them for round one? Because you saw, many of you saw in the award letters that our, our um, funding formula was really two part. It was based on the size and type of your program, really small, like individual family provider, all the way up to multi-site. We have 15 sites and over 500 kids. And so what we did is we, we, we looked at both of those factors, your size and type, and then the number of children that you were um, approved to serve. And you got your, and your award was based on those two figures together. So we found that that was, a, we really thought that was a fair and equitable way to account for size and, and children served while making sure people got enough money to get them started. And that process was approved by um, the Gopher Committee. And we actually, you know, we actually did use the financials a bit when we were, when we had some questions. So, um, 
And so we, it wasn't that we asked for them and didn't need them. And also, like I said earlier, you don't need to submit a second, a second application. Round two, um, which is gonna start, we're gonna start reviewing in the next couple of weeks for round two. Um, you'll have already sent us your financials, so done and done. And then you'll just you know, be talking to us about helping us understand your needs and circumstances a little bit better. So the, so the next question we've heard is, why all the strings? Um, Main Street didn't have any strings. They just got the money out and, and that was that. Well, actually, Bofer, as in, in, in its entirety, all of its money has strings or monitoring requirements. And these are federal dollars and with federal, actually state grants, federal grants, there are always monitoring and accountability requirements because it's public funds. And so, you know, so the departments and the state have to be able to um, stand up to a, a, an audit and show that, that funds were used appropriately and for purposes for which they were designed, et cetera, et cetera. So even Main Street had strings that there were accountabilities. Um, and there was a provision that if you didn't, you didn't use them or um, use them correctly, that you had to pay it back. So our, our accountabilities were actually mostly given to us by um, the Gopher Committee saying this, this is what goes in the agreement. So the agreements you got, I would say about 90% of that content was given to us by the Gopher Committee saying these are the standard accountabilities. And we had a couple of our own trying to minimize what we asked of you because we're very aware of burden. Um, but so that's why there are accountabilities. And I also like to, to remind us that this is an unprecedented opportunity. We, we have a chance to really look at the needs and challenges and how, and how people are designing their programs to respond to the, the quickly changing needs of communities and families and children and staff and, and come forward you know, even, even stronger, um, redesigning, uh, retooling, and, and even making themselves um, less vulnerable to things like pandemics. So that information and data that we get is gonna position us really well to attract future funds, but also it will help inform our policy going forward. We'll be looking at all of our policies and, and how what we're learning from these experiences that we're all facing right now um, should inform those policies. What needs to change? What needs to strengthen? What needs to be added? to help programs, you know, not only survive these times, but, but thrive. So the next question is, why don't your numbers match mine for children approved to serve? So we talked a little bit about that already. And the major reason was, um, so our Friends in Child Care Licensing Unit do a fabulous job of keeping data on the numbers of children that licensing approves um, that can be served in a program. Um, sometimes if there is a, a recent change in that where, you know, there's been um, children added um, or a site added or um, in, in the case of COVID, maybe there's been a waiver to add children, the number that we have might not be an exact match for your number. Um, and the other thing that we learned was that some, um, some pro programs submitted for children that were not um, that, we, that were not included in this, in this funding. For example, um, there were school children from a school that provided an application all the way up through you know, uh, middle school. Um, so you know, we would need to talk to that program and say, well, if you've got early childhood and after school, absolutely, but we can't fund the other 300 children in your school. So, so there were challenges like that, um, but we encourage you to please Take a look at the numbers, and if there's any discrepancy in your understanding of the number that you're approved to serve and what we've put in your award letter, please let us know right away, and we'll talk to you, resolve it, and we'll make an immediate adjustment to your award as appropriate. And if you have any questions about that, again, you know, please reach out to, to us. And then lastly, there was, um, I think there was some, ex there was some expectations that unfortunately couldn't, couldn't be met. So for example, someone said, well, my award, my award was much smaller than I expected. It won't even cover my rent. Well, even though the pandemic, you know, if there's been any bright light that has emerged from this, is that now more than ever, I don't know that there's a person in the state of New Hampshire that doesn't clearly understand the critical importance 
of childcare to the state's economies and to families so they can work and to the businesses so their workers can work. I, you know, I think finally everybody gets it. Um, however, these funds, CARES Act funds, were never designed to be able to make programs and businesses whole. In fact, we learned that Main Street only covered up to 17% of a business's CARES um, uh, COVID related losses. So again, the, the funds, they're just, they're not enough, although we wish they were, they're not enough and they're not designed to make everybody whole. So we'll do the best we can with the funding we have and we'll count on you to tell us your most important priorities and you know, see what can be funded in the context of allowable expenses. And um, I, I like to think about this, you know, I think as Marty said it, you know, sitting in the grass for the first time or you know, us walking a path together, you know, navigating these COVID waters. I like to think of us as going and doing it together and figuring out how to come through to the other side even stronger even better able to provide the services to children and families. And part of that will be to work together to identify additional funds and resources as we go forward to keep this process moving and to keep supporting our, our much needed childcare programs. So just because CCRSP ends on December 30 doesn't mean that we're not gonna be looking for additional ways to provide you with the support you need to stay strong. So thank you for your time. If, are there any questions that um, I should address? Yes, Deborah, there's quite a few questions coming in. Um, as you were speaking, you answered most of them. Um, something people are very interested in is, is there an expected time frame from once people have their signed uh, documents in that they can expect to hear or receive their funding? Oh, that's going to be fast. So once we have your signed document, we are going to immediately send you, actually starting tomorrow, um, your invoice packet. And, and so, you know, as soon as you get that, um, then you can turn around and submit your first invoice and then checks will start going out next week. Thank you. Another one people are asking for is clarification on what the money can be used for. An example that was sent in is if they could hire somebody um, as part-time help in the meantime, um, and what other guidance we can give them on that. So certainly staffing that you need for you know, COVID to be able to meet the guidelines, that's certainly an acceptable expense. Um, anything that is directly related to the, the pandemic. You know, you have to do social distancing. You still need more supplies because, you know, DHHS, the supply um, program is ending. Um, you need to buy specific materials around, um, you know, helping children, you know, social emotionally cope with pandemics or supporting your families or doing outreach to your families to, you know, provide them with information and support during COVID. Um, Anything that's that you can directly tie to the pandemic is fundable. I, I did see in the chat the, to the panelists, somebody asked, what about self-care? Um, well, I, I think in self-care, and, and we mentioned that as one of the fundable things. Um, I, I would say that if it's reasonable, for example, you're gonna have Tracy's folks do a webinar on how to you know, bust your stress, or you know, you're gonna, you're gonna you know, help your you know, do some activities to help your staff and your families or whatever um, to better care for themselves do self-care during this I, I would say yes I, I can't you know I would have to see what the, the asks ASKS are around that I would say if you pitch us that you need to take your whole staff to the Bahamas to decompress that probably is not supportable although if it was we'll come with you um, but, you know, again, anything that's reasonable. Now, some things we heard that are not fundable, which, you know, I had talked about earlier, which was one of the reasons we couldn't give you a total number. We had folks ask for things like, well, I need to redo my landscaping. Um, I need a new roof. Um, you know, things like that, you know, that, that are not directly related to COVID and the pandemic are not covered in the CARES Act. So if you have a specific question about a specific thing, is this or is this not covered, please reach out to us. And because we will, 
if we don't know the answer, then we will certainly get it from Gopher because you know they're very clear on what does and does not constitute a, um, a covered expense. Any other questions, Emma? Um, the ones that are coming in now, I'll just continue to type up and we can post them on Child Care Aware in the interest of time. Um, but thank you. Okay. Well, and thank you so much, everybody. And I apologize that there's been so many questions and confusion out there around how this was all unfolding. And I, I became aware some people didn't even realize there's a round two and, um, you know, that they thought round one was it. And, um, you know, some, some of those other questions. So we are, we are working very hard, but we'll work harder to make sure that you have the information you need to understand, you know, this program as it goes forward. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Deborah. In the interest of time, um, I will post the update from Child Care Aware of New Hampshire on our website for folks. Uh, but please bear in mind, we are having a summer sneak peek on Tuesday in the evening. If you'd like more information about our updates, we'll be providing it at that time um, as well. So to close, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. Special thanks to Patricia Tilley for providing updates and responding to questions tied to public health. Um, to close, we'd like to remind you to complete the session evaluation survey. This is included in your initial registration email for this webinar. This recording will be posted on the www.nh.childcarewear.org website under a page entitled Recovery and Stabilization under our COVID-19 tab. This page will be populated and up within one business day. As I indicated earlier, these webinars are being conducted every other week on Thursdays beginning at 1230 through to August 20th. Registration information for the webinar series is available through the New Hampshire Professional Registry. And a flyer regarding um, this series is posted on the Child Care Wear of New Hampshire website on the front page slider. Our next session is being provided on July 23rd from 1230 to two o'clock uh, p.m. And then just some parting thoughts. Uh, yesterday, we shared a post on our Facebook page that said, and I, and I quote, uh, look for something positive in each day, even if some days you have to look a little harder. And I wanted to share just some positive comments shared on that page before we, before we close. An individual commented that she had beautiful pieces of time spent with each of the children individually doing activities they love. Another commented that they got their funding notice from CCRSP, which they will always refer to as Crispy. And <laughs> that their son had improved in the, in the NICU and we're, we're grateful to hear that. And another indicated that seeing the passion and devotion and ability of their staff to step up in stressful situations that are beyond their control while still smiling and carrying on was their positive. So as we leave you this afternoon, we hope this webinar session leaves you in a positive light with more information and feeling more up to date. In addition, we hope our upcoming sessions will enable you to obtain the information and resources you need to continue the wonderful work you do to support families, children, and the state of New Hampshire. We hope you enjoy the next few weeks of midsummer. Uh, be safe and well, and thank you for your time and interest today and enjoy the remainder of your afternoon. Uh, we will leave the webinar open if you have other comments that um, Emma can capture as well. Thank you.